Welcome to the third video in the 2020 Digital Performance Series from Capital Shakespeare in Bismarck, North Dakota. My name is Erin Weichel and I am the Artistic Director of Capital Shakespeare. We are so glad we are able to bring some Shakespeare to our community, even if we can't be together in person due to COVID-19. What you are about to watch are a series of scenes and monologues from shows we have done so far in our 12-year history. We have grown immensely over the years and are so proud and grateful for all the support we have received from the community. If you want to learn more about our company or if you are able to donate to help keep the arts alive and thriving in Bismarck, please visit our website at www.capitalshakespeare.org. In our seventh year, we decided to tackle the great dramatic tragedy of Macbeth. We took a chance and placed it in a post-apocalyptic time period. The show was one of the shortest that Shakespeare wrote, so it has also been one of the least edited scripts we have done so far. Today, you will see our original Macbeth and Lady Macbeth reprise their roles and do the famous screw your courage to the sticking place scene. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed, then as his host who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath been so meek in his faculties, hath been so clear in his great office that, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off and pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. How now? What news? He hath almost supped. Why did you leave the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, you not, he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since? And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the old cat in the adage? Privy, peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time, nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck. I know how tender it is to love the babe that milks you. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my swollen nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn to you as you have done to this. If we should fail. We fail? Screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his hard day's journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a flume, and the receipt of reason a libbeck only, when in swinish sleep their drenched natures lies in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers, who shall bear the guilt of our great well? I am settled, and bend up each corporeal.
corporeal agent to this terrible feat. Away, and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. Although the play revolves around the title character of Macbeth, the witches are some of the most memorable characters in the show and have lines that everyone remembers. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Toad that under cold stone days and nights has thirty-one. Sweltered venom sleeping got, boil thou first in the charmed pot. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a penny snake, in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing. Pour a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble, double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. One of the most memorable speeches in Macbeth comes from his wife. This speech has been parodied for numerous ad campaigns and memes, even some about hand washing, but is a heartbreaking look at what grief and guilt can do to the mind. Out, damn spot. Out, I say! One, two, why then tis time to do it. Hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie, what a soldier and a feared. What need we fear who knows it when none can call our power to account? Yet who would have known the old man to have so much blood in him? <laughs> the thing a fife had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands never be clean? No more of that, my lord, no more of that. You mar all with this starting. Here's the smell of the blood still. All the perfumes in Arabia could not sweeten this little hand. Oh, oh. Gown. Look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried. He cannot come out on his grave. Too bad. Too bad. There's no gate at the gate. Come. 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 Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. For our eighth season, we performed Comedy of Errors, which is a hysterical comedy that requires not one, but two sets of twins. Shakespeare loved to use twins in his shows, but this one he doubled down on the comedy by using two sets. The show opens with Aegean explaining how his twin sons were separated and paired with a pair of twin sons born to a servant. A heavier task could not have been imposed than I to speak my grief unspeakable. In Syracusa was I born and wed. We lived a life of joy. Our wealth increased by prosperous voyages I often took to Epidanum. I made provision for her following me and soon she safe arrived where I was. There. Had she not been long, but she became the joyful mother of two goodly sons. And which was strange, the one so like the other as could not be distinguished but by names. That very hour, in the self-same inn, 
a meaner woman was delivered of such a burden. Twin males, both alike. Those, for her parents were exceeding poor, I bought and brought up to attend my sons. My wife, not meanly proud of two such boys, made daily motion for our home return. Unwillingly, I agreed. And alas, too soon we came aboard. A league from Epidanum had we sailed, before the hour's wind obeying deep gave any tragic instance of our harm. But longer did we not retain much hope. For what obscure light the heavens did grant did but convey unto our fearful minds a doubtful warrant of our immediate death. The sailors sought for safety by our boat and left the ship then sinking ripe to us. My wife, more careful of the ladder born, fastened him to a small spare mast such as seafaring men provide for storms. One of the other twins was bound to him, whilst I was like heedful of the other. The children thus disposed, my wife and I fixed our eyes on whom our care was fixed, fastened ourselves at either end the mast, floating straight, obedient to the stream, was carried toward Corinth as we thought. At length, the sun gazing upon the earth did disperse those vapors that offended us. And by the benefit of that blessed light, the seas waxed calm and we discovered two ships from far making a main to us. Of Corinth this, of Epideru that. But ere those ships could meet by twice five leagues, we were encountered by a mighty rock which being violently borne upon, our helpful ship was split in the midst, such that in this unjust divorce of us, fortune had left to each of us alike what to delight in and what to sorrow for. For her part, poor soul, seeming as burdened by lesser weight, but not by lesser woe, was carried with more speed before the wind. And in our sight, they three were taken up. At length, another ship had seized on us, and knowing whom it was their hap to save, gave helpful welcome to their shipwrecked guests. And would have reft the fishes of their, bark, of their prey, had not their bark been very slow of sail. And therefore homeward did they bend their course. Thus you have heard me severed from my bliss. That by misfortune was my life prolonged to tell sad stories of my own mishaps. Dromeo is a servant to Antipholus and has had a run in with a serving wench in the kitchen who has claimed him as her own. He does not know her and wants nothing to do with her and describes his encounter with her to his master Antipholus. Here are our original Dromeo and Antipholus who also played their own twins to reprise their roles and bring us this great scene. Oh, respond, master. Respond. Why, how now, Dromeo? Where runs thou so fast? Do you, do you know me, sir? Am I Dromeo? Am I your man? Am I myself? Thou art Dromeo, thou art my man. Thou art thyself. Oh, I am an ass. I am a woman's man, and besides myself. What, what woman's man, and, and how besides thyself? Oh, Mary, sir, besides myself, I am due unto a woman. One that claims me, one that haunts me, one that will have me. What claim lays she to thee? Oh, Mary, sir. Such a claim as you would lay to your horse. She would have me as a beast. Uh, not that I, being a beast, she would have me. Uh, but that she, being a very beastly creature, lays claim to me. What is she? Oh, very reverend body. I, such a one as a man may not speak of without he say, Sir Reverence, I have but lean luck in the match. 
and yet she is a wondrous fat marriage. How dost thou mean a fat marriage? Oh, Mary, sir, she is the kitchen wench and all grease. And I know not what used to put her to, but to make a lamp of her and run from her by her own light. What complexion is she of? Oh, uh, swart, uh, like my shoe, but her face nothing half so clean kept. For why? She sweats. That's a fault that water will mend? Oh no, sir, tis in grain. Noah's flood could not do it. Well, what's her name? N Nell, sir. Uh, but her name and three quarters, uh, that's an L, and three quarters could not measure her from hip to hip. Oh, well, then she bears some breadth? Uh, no longer from head to foot uh, than from hip to hip. Uh, she is spherical, like a globe. Uh, I could find out countries in her. In what part of her body stands Ireland? Oh, Mary, in her buttocks. I found it out by the bogs. Where? France. Uh, in her forehead, armed and reverted, making war against her hair. Where? <laughs> England. Oh, I, I looked for the chalky cliffs, but I could find no whiteness in them. Uh, but I guess it stood uh, in her chin by the salt room that ran between France and it. Where? America. The Indies. Oh, sir, I did not look so low. To conclude, this drudge or diviner laid claim to me. It called me Dromeo, swore I was a sure to her. It told me what privy marks I had about me, uh, as the mark of my shoulder, uh, the mole in my neck, uh, the great wart in my left arm, so that I, amazed, ran from her as from a witch. And I think, if my breast had not been made of faith in my heart of steel, she had transformed me to a curdle dog and made me turn in the wheel. I will not harbor in this town tonight. If any bark put forth, come to the mart where I will walk till thou return to me. If everyone knows us and we know none, tis time, I think, to trudge, pack, and be oh, gone. Yes. As from a bear a man would flun for life, so fly I from her that would be my wife. <laughs> we celebrated our ninth season and one of Shakespeare's first folios coming to Bismarck with our classically staged and costumed production of Much Ado About Nothing. Much Ado follows a quarrelsome pair of lovers, Beatrice and Benedict, who refuse to love, although they are perfect for each other. I wonder that you will still be talking, Signor Benedict. Nobody marks you. Why, my dear Lady Disdain, are you yet living? <laughs> Is it possible Disdain should die when she have so meat of food as Signor Benedict? <laughs> courtesy itself would convert to Disdain if it came in your presence. Well, then is courtesy a turncoat. But it is certain I am loved of all ladies, only you accepted. And I would that I could find in my heart that I had not a hard heart, for truly, I love none. Hmm. Then that is a dear happiness to women, for they would be greeted with a pernicious suitor. I am glad I am of a cold heart as you are. I would rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. God keep your ladyship still in that mind, so some gentleman or other shall scape a pre- Destinate, scratched face. Well, scratching would not make it better were it such a freight face as yours is. You are a rare parrot teacher. Better a bird of my tongue than a beast of yours. I would that my horse had the speed of your tongue and so good a continuer. But keep your way. In God's name, I have done. You always end with a jade's trick. I know you of old. This can be no trick. The conference was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. They seem to pity the lady. Seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? Why, it must be requited. I will be horribly in love with her. 
Against my will, I am sent to bid you come into dinner. Fair Beatrice, I thank you for your pains. I took no more pains to tell you than you take pains to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure, then, in the message? As much as you would upon a knife's point. You have no stomach, senor. Fare you well. Ha! Against my will, I am sent to bid you come in to dinner. <laughs> There's a double meaning in that. I took no more pains for those things than you took pains to thank me. <laughs> Why, that's as much as to say, any pains I take for you is as easy as thanks. If I do not take pity of her, I am a villain. What fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt, farewell. And maiden pride, adieu. No glory lives on the back of such as these. And Benedict, love on. I will requite thee. Others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reporting thee. Do not you love me? <laughs> Why, no! No more than reason. <laughs> Why, then, <clears throat> your uncle and the prince and Claudio have been deceived. They swore you did. Do not you love me? Troth? No. No more than reason. Well, then my cousin, Margaret and Ursula have been deceived, for they swore you did. They swore that you were almost sick for me. They said you were well nigh dead for me. It is no such matter. Then you do not love me? No. But in friendly recompense. Come, I will have thee. But by this light I take thee for pity. <laughs> I would not deny you, but by this good day I yield greatly to persuasion and partly to save your life, for I was told you were in a consumption. Peace. I will stop your mouth. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching tonight. We will be bringing one more digital performance to you this week. Make sure to check back tomorrow for scenes and monologues from seasons 10 through 12 of Capital Shakespeare. If you miss a night, don't worry, we will be posting all of our videos on our website at www.capitalshakespeare.org and on our various social media accounts. See you tomorrow!